my name is Aldrin Montana, and my talk is titled Decomposing Compute to Grow Computational Storage. And this work is a collaboration between three primary groups. Uh, so we've been working with the Systems Biology uh, Research Lab at UC Santa Cruz, uh, headed by Josh Stewart. And uh, Bianca Shui is a PhD student in that lab. And also with Seagate, and the main collaborator there is Philip Kufelt, who's a storage technologist. Uh, and <clears throat> on the computer science side at UC Santa Cruz, there is myself, uh, Jeff Lefevre, Carlos Melton, and Peter Alvaro, who's my primary PhD advisor. So in this talk, I want to you know, talk about uh, our approach to computational, computational storage, right? And so here I'm just showing um, if we have an application, application data on the left and a computational storage system on the right, um, there's this area in the middle, which is how do we uh, send a data query or you know an IO request uh, to the storage system? And then how do we get back combined results um, you know, assuming a storage system with many devices. Um, and I want to start with our real world scientific use case, right? And so we're really designing around or using the human cell atlas as a anchor uh, for our designs. And so what the human cell atlas is, is an international collaborative consortium um, that tries to chart like all the cell types in a healthy human body. Right, and so there, the data that they store uh, is single cell uh, sequencing data, which is really think of it as RNA transcriptomics, uh, but at cellular resolution. Right, so they have this information for every cell, and so they're accumulating data from uh, many multinational uh, research labs. And uh, here I show a figure from a recent paper that uh, on the left shows the potential medical impacts of the human cell atlas or similar consortiums. And then on the right, uh, either existing challenges or future challenges um, it, that, that need to be addressed in order to realize these impacts uh, either at all or at scale, right? And so if we look at the challenges, right? Um, I think some of the challenges that computational storage uh, would have the most impact for um, are these, right? So of course there's, you know, for bioinformatics, you need a lot of samples, you need a lot of diversity, um, and the way the technologies work, you just need a lot of, you know, statistical power, right? And then with storing all these samples or all the data for these samples, you know, it leads directly into the, like, this open data um, scenario, right? Where uh, the human cell atlas or similar consortiums are accumulating all this data and trying to make it, uh, you know, mostly publicly accessible uh, or at least accessible to many research labs. Uh, so that they can collaborate and uh, get to, you know, insights either faster or just insights that they couldn't reach before on their own, right? And so it's really like a consortium like this is really trying to enable this type of large scale collaborative efforts. And so the open data aspect is going to be a lot of data, but a lot of complex data as well. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see that there's several data modalities uh, that are that, that need to be integrated across in order to enable precision medicine or like bioinformatics um, and these sorts of things, right? And so if we look at uh, these modalities a little bit closer, there's about six of them really, but what we're interested in is at the cellular and molecular level, right? Or like that's at least what the HCA is most interested in, right? And so um, what I've shown on the right here are a couple of things to kind of contextualize a little bit more like the data set sizes, right? So the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, has a project that they call Cell by Gene Discover, right? And this project uh, is up to 38 million uh, unique cells uh, across 700 data sets, right? And this, this project will kind of like become publicly accessible like later this year. Um, so it's like still very early. And then this table on the bottom right uh, also shows data sizes, right? And so I've talked about cells, right? But for the single cell data, uh, really you can think of it as like many matrices. And so um, a column in the matrix might be uh, the data for a single cell. And then the rows of the matrix might be data for a gene across many cells, right? And so the unique cells really talks to all the columns across all the matrices. Whereas uh, this middle call, the second column in this table, uh, unique proteins really talks about like proteins or genes, um, which is how many rows you might find in each matrix you have. 
right? And so these data sizes on the bottom right uh, are if you have matrices of these dimensions and you're storing doubles in each, right? Because uh, maybe they're already normalized, right? I, I think uh, the raw data might have integers, right? So depending on where you are, the resolution you want, the data size can change, but this is just to get a sense of the magnitude, uh, right? And so for this magnitude of data and like they're gonna be getting much more data, uh, you know, you can imagine a storage system, right? With many storage servers and then many attached hard drives, right? And like, that's the model we wanna start from. <clears throat> and so what we, we, we would call this storage system or we're gonna refer to the storage system as a storage hierarchy, right? And it's because this hierarchy may become deeper, it may become wider, right? And we envision that this whole hierarchy is gonna gain more processors throughout the hierarchy and that uh, it's going to gain more uh, hardware heterogeneity, right? So um, in this figure, we show uh, hard drives at the bottom with attached compute uh, or processors. So those are computational hard drives. Um, these cache nodes that might sit on top or upstream of uh, some of these storage nodes uh, might have attached solid state drives. And those would be, um, you know, have attached processors themselves. And then you might also have like a mix of storage servers, right? So maybe some servers are database nodes or just have more resources. Um, and then at the top of it is a client or compute node, right? Really just any uh, anything requesting data from the, the storage system that might also want some processing, right? And so uh, the thing about the storage hierarchy, right, is uh, not only do we envision that in general, it may become deeper or wider, right? But as we accumulate more data in these uh, in these drives or in these storage nodes, uh, that gravity of that data increases. And so over time, you're not going to want to move the data unless you really have to, right? And so that just further motivates that this storage hierarchy will just evolve and become more heterogeneous over time. Um, yeah. And so in order to leverage these resources, we think that we are desperately in need of a computational IO stack, right? How do we, how do we, distribute uh, data accesses and processes or processing across this whole hierarchy. And so that leads us to uh, our approach to computational storage uh, or this computational IO stack, uh, which we call decomposable queries. And so to illustrate uh, decomposable queries, uh, here I show a, query a logical query plan on the left with uh, functions or operators in uh, circles. And then the purple arrows represent data movement through these functions, right? So the uh, and, and then at the bottom, these are just some data sets um, for an ex illustrative example. So data might go through a scan or a read. It might uh, be projected to just a few columns of say the table. And then there's a join sort where like, uh, maybe we're integrating it with other data set and then uh, you know doing something like a sort for some reason. And then uh, at the top uh, here, this is an aggregate function, which might be uh, getting an average, right? And so this query plan represents this simplified question of what zip code in California has the highest average value of houses, right? And this question, uh, you know, it's not the main motivation I uh, described before, but it's just a, uh, a simple question in order to really understand decomposable queries. And um, another thing I want to mention is that this query plan is really like an IR or an intermediate representation for data processing, right? So you have code or you have uh, SQL queries, right? And those can get mapped to a query plan. And then that query plan can be passed to engines for further processing or for uh, actual execution. <clears throat> so now let's consider a storage hierarchy uh, that we might be sending this query plan to, right? With a client or compute node at the top, uh, several storage servers, uh, which we call storage nodes. And then each storage node uh, might be attached to multiple hard drives with uh, attached processors, which we'll call computational drives. <clears throat> and we can imagine that for these two data sets, house, house addresses and house values, we might distribute it across the storage hierarchy. Um, but just for this illustration, uh, I want to talk about a data set being in a, in a uh, associated with a computational drive. But the two data sets are, uh, you know, on different drives, uh, which are uh, owned or different storage nodes are responsible for the data, data sets. Um, and so let's consider the ways we can execute this query plan, right? So the naive or the simplest execution might be executing the whole query plan at the client, 
right? And this requires moving all the data in our storage hierarchy north or upwards the hierarchy uh, to the clients for the execution. Um, so this is by far the simplest execution uh, approach, but it also means the most data movement throughout the hierarchy, right? And so here I show it would be 260 gig, gig, gigabytes to go from the computational drives to the storage servers and the storage servers to the client uh, if we assume that each data set is 130 gigabytes. Now let's consider we want to execute the whole query plan uh, at the storage servers, right? So the results coming back to the client might just be the highest average value, which is just maybe eight bytes. Um, but we still have a lot of data movement going from the drives to the storage server. And um, if we also realize that the data sets are in different storage servers, uh, that means we need some east-west data movement. Uh, and in this case, it would be two gigabytes, right? And I, I kind of show this in the small query plan in the purple box, right? And the reason for this is the projection actually reduces the data to 1.5%. So 1.5% 1 of 130 gigabytes is just about two, two gigabytes. So we can visualize this query plan actually more like this, where either uh, we execute the smaller plan uh, and then move the data, and then we execute the larger chain all at once, or we execute part of the larger chain uh, in parallel with the other um, portion of the query plan, uh, the data moves, and then we complete, uh, we finish the rest of the query plan, right? Um, yeah, so now let's consider if we want to execute the whole query plan at the computational drives, right? It's going to look exactly like executing at the storage servers, um, but you're going to have much less data movement from the drives to the servers, um, you know, because you're just going to be returning the end result. Uh, you'll still have that east-west data movement, right? But computational drives are much less likely to have the resources necessary to maybe do a complex operation like join sort, right? Or something that might do a pass over all of the data, right? And so this isn't ideal, um, even though the data movement uh, is ideal. And so what we might do is we might split this query plan uh, to have a mixed execution approach, right? Where part of the query plan is executed at each drive, and then another part of the query plan is executed at the storage service, right? And in this case, uh, the pink box is at the storage servers, and then this dark purple box is executed at the computation drives, right? So um, the second storage node might have the results from this projection. The left storage node might have the results from the selection, and the selection has a, uh, reduces the data set size to 10%, right? Which is why this 15 gigs. Um, and then we still have that east-west data movement, uh, but the reason that I show this two gigabytes in parentheses is because actually, you know, as an optimization, we could even move it directly from this drive to the storage server instead of doing the on the extra hop to this uh, to the second storage server, right? And so in this case, we see that um, if the storage servers uh, have more compute resources, this might make more sense. Um, we have still reduced the data movement overall through the storage hierarchy, but potentially the storage service can execute uh, the more complex or more intensive operations. Um, with more resources, right? And the thing about all these execution approaches, right, is that all examples yield the same answer, uh, but with different efficiencies, right? So uh, data movement changes, right? And the end-to-end uh, -end latency for the query execution might change, depending on where we're doing these things. Um, and so what I've just described, right, is that we might have an upstream device uh, and we'll receive a query plan from that upstream device. We might propagate that whole query plan or part of the query plan to a downstream device. And so in this case, an upstream device might be the client. A downstream device might be a computational drive. And we might be you know, at the storage server. Um, the downstream device will complete whatever uh, processing it does. It will return the results and a query plan that kind of describes what was done. right? So in the case uh, of this example here, um, we would get the results from the computational drive for the projection. Um, and then we would get a query plan that describes, ah, this was a projection. So we don't need this whole query plan. We can maybe just have, um, you know, what does the data look like now, right? Um, and then depending on if we get a complex query plan back, um, maybe we have to do some changes to our query plan to say, ah, not all of it was executed. Um, but either way, we would send the rest of the query plan that we now have um, to the engine for further execution, um, maybe using the results that was uh, 
received from the downstream device, and then those results would be sent back up to the upstream device, right? And so if we look at this a little bit more, um, what we're doing is we're using, or the way we're doing this is we're using two uh, tools primarily. Uh, so Substrate, uh, which is a standard or standardized representation of query plans, um, and then Apache Arrow, which is uh, at its core an in-memory data format for columnar data, but also um, provides a query ex uh, execution engine that integrates well with Substrate, right? And so Substrate is used for propagating query plans throughout the storage hierarchy, but Apache Arrow is used for executing a query plan at a device and also uh, you know, for the results and the data that we're sending throughout the hierarchy. So how do we use Substrate? So if we consider this query plan again, uh, that might be sent from the client to a storage node, right? Then at the storage node, we want to say which portion of this query plan is even relevant to the data we're responsible for, right? And so for the second storage node, that might be this portion of the query plan um, that has operators on the house values, right? And then this is what that substrate might look like. And so here we have the house values data set. It is going through a read or a scan operation. And the output of that operation is then input to this projection operation or project as it's called in substrate. So here is some Python code that uh, kind of is used to produce that substrate, right? And so here we see a uh, query expression, basically, right? It's like a data set, and then what columns do we want in the projection? Um, this data set is defined here, right? And so that would just be for this example, um, but ultimately the table or the data sets schema needs to be described somewhere. Um, and then we send this query expression to a substrate compiler, which returns back um, serialized uh, protobuf, which when we print it, this is exactly what we get on the left here. Um, so now what we have is this portion of the query plan that we send down as a, uh, you know, to a downstream device. <laughs> so then how do we use Apache Arrow? So here, if we're at a computational drive, right, and this is the query plan or the portion of the query plan that we have, uh, in the bottom left is some Python for how we execute it. Um, and some details is we can execute it in certain ways, like to function as a canary, like do we want to run this on the whole data set or all the data we would apply it to, or just some chunks, right? Um, there's ways of executing it in a way that um, we can optimize the overall process, right? But uh, we'll go ahead and just look at how we do that execution. So uh, this is Python code again. And so there's two functions here, uh, the, uh, and they're using um, PyArrow, which is Arrow's Python library. And uh, so the bottom function execute substrate uses a substrate module of PyArrow, and it takes two arguments, the substrate plan or the query plan and substrate and a table provider function, right? And that table provider function is defined at the top. And what it does is it takes a name for a data set or a table or whatever, and it just returns whatever data as an arrow table for that name. And so here I show uh, reading it from the file system as a CSV, right? And so the house values, maybe it's stored in a CSV, we read it, return it as an uh, arrow table, right? And then what the, sub what the run query function does is it executes this query plan shown in pink on the data set that was returned by the table provider. Um, and then this read all function will take the results of executing that query plan and just uh, return it as a single arrow table. And so this is what it would look like, where the top is the original data uh, with all the columns, and then the bottom is that data, but like with the projection applied. So maybe we project only the first four columns or four arbitrary columns. Uh, and so that's how we use Apache Arrow. And so just overview again, uh, we're interested in this portion. We're using substrate and arrow. Um, our system uh, is designed with Skyhook and Ceph in mind. So Ceph's an object storage system, and the Skyhook brings uh, data management operations to Ceph. Um, and then this is using Seagate drives, uh, Seagate's research uh, key, key value drives. Uh, so here are some references. And that is the talk. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day.